Five women, a dark haired beauty in high heels and a fur coat with a murderous judo chop, a wealthy socialite with a wooden leg, the first black woman to star in a major motion picture, a quiet and sensitive Indian princess, and a steely eyed Jewish woman with a penchant for creative weapons such as rats stuffed with explosives. What do these women have in common? They are five of the most wildly courageous female spies of World War II. Here are their stories. I'm Charity Mainwaring and this is Strong Stories. Hit the subscribe button for more true stories of brave women who shaped history. Nancy Wake was born in 1912, raised in Australia, and ran away from home at age 16. In her young 20s, she found her way to Paris and began life as a freelance journalist. While traveling Europe in the 1930s, Nancy witnessed roving bands of Nazis beating and whipping Jews, and she vowed that if there was ever an opportunity for her to do something against Hitler, she would be ready. In 1937, Nancy was wooed by a French millionaire industrialist named Henri Fioca, but turned off by his playboy lifestyle, she insisted, no, we'll just be friends. However, when Fioca proposed to her again two years later, she finally gave in. Despite his past, Fioca had eyes only for Nancy, and the two fell deeply in love. When Germany invaded France in 1940, Nancy joined the French resistance, helping Jews and downed Allied airmen escape into neutral Spain over the mountains. After many successful rescues and narrow escapes, the Germans angrily dubbed Nancy the White Mouse, an irritating infiltrator they could not seem to get their hands on. In 1943, Nancy was arrested while traveling with false identification papers, but the Germans had no idea they had finally caught the White Mouse. Nancy made up a story about how she was cheating on her husband and consequently needed fake papers. Apparently she was convincing because the Germans let her go. Undaunted, Nancy escaped to Britain, joined Churchill's special operations executive, and then parachuted back into France in 1944, dressed in a fur coat and high heels. Obviously what you would choose for a parachuting expedition. On one occasion when a crucial radio was destroyed, she rode her bike 200 kilometers past several German checkpoints to the nearest radio, hailing each group of soldiers with a flirtatious smile and a, hello officers, do you want to search me? It worked every time and they waved her right through. A male compatriot said, she is the most feminine woman I know until the fighting starts and then she's like five men. Nancy led a raid on a Gestapo headquarters in the heart of France, which took them completely by surprise, killing 38 Germans. Her stated belief was that the only good Nazi was a dead Nazi. And she put this into practice along with her judo training she received in Britain by chopping a Gestapo agent in the neck and kicking him in the privates for good measure Commenting later, she was shocked to find she had killed him. Nancy Wake went on to live a full life after the war and died at the age of 98. She was the most decorated female spy of World War II, receiving honors from France, the UK, the US, and Australia. The most successful American spy in World War II was a physically disabled woman who couldn't get a job. Before the war, Virginia Hall moved to Europe with dreams of becoming a diplomat. Despite her fluency in six languages, plus an Ivy League education, Hall was repeatedly told her job application had become lost. When she lost her leg in a hunting accident, two things happened. She acquired a wooden leg from the knee down, which she nicknamed Cuthbert, and she was permanently banned from applying for diplomatic posts due to her disability. When World War II broke out, Hall embraced the dangerous work of a French ambulance driver. With the fall of France to the Germans, she escaped to freedom over the Pyrenees Mountains on foot, limping 50 miles in the snow over death-defying mountain passes. During this escape, Hall encountered a British spy who was so impressed with her that he recruited her as a special agent. After a few months training in London, Hall was spirited back to occupied France. Virginia Hall was a mistress of disguise, using code names and makeup to alter her identity constantly. Sometimes she was several different 
different women in a single day. Disguised as a reporter, Hall published a resistance newspaper providing vital information to thousands of French and British operatives. She set up safe houses and an escape network for downed Allied pilots, often whisking airmen to safety just minutes before the Gestapo closed in on their locations. Not even prisons were safe from Hall as she smuggled metal files and radios into French jails and then smuggled escapees over the mountains into Spain using any vehicle she could find. On one occasion, she used an ambulance used to transport patients of an insane asylum. Posters went up all over France telling Germans to be on the lookout for a limping woman, the most dangerous enemy spy. The head of the Gestapo in Lyon, Klaus Barbie, was exasperated after one jailbreak and reportedly fumed, I'd give anything to get my hands on that limping Canadian bitch. With a price on her head, Hall was betrayed by an informant. The Gestapo burst into her headquarters, only to find that Hall had gotten wind of the betrayal hours earlier and had escaped over the Pyrenees yet again. Hall sent a final message to London saying she hoped Cuthbert didn't give her any trouble along the way. Not realizing that was how she jokingly referred to her wooden prosthetic leg, the ruthless reply was, if Cuthbert gives trouble, eliminate him. Incredibly, Hall returned to France a year later, this time working for the Americans. She organized the destruction of several bridges deep in occupied France just hours before the D-Day landings. She served out the rest of her life as America's first female secret agent in the newly formed CIA and eventually married a fellow spy. President Truman wished to award her the Distinguished Service Cross, but she refused, not wanting her cover to be blown. Hall died in 1982, her exploits largely unknown to all but a few fellow agents. Josephine Baker was born into poverty in Missouri in 1906. She ran away from home at 13 and found work as a traveling dancer and actress. She achieved a degree of success in New York on Broadway, but always believed her true breakthrough came when she traveled to Paris in 1925 as a stage performer. American jazz had become all the rage in France, and Baker quickly captured the attention of the City of Lights. Garnering widespread buzz, Baker starred in several French movies and became the first black woman to star in a major motion picture. She gained the admiration of such celebrated figures as Pablo Picasso, Ernest Hemingway, and E.E. E. Cummings. When Hitler conquered France in 1940, Baker found herself in a unique position. She loathed the Nazis, but her popularity placed her in high demand. She was able to move in the most elite diplomatic circles, rubbing shoulders with those in power, and putting even German and Italian leaders at their ease. No one knew that the gorgeous and talented Josephine Baker had agreed to serve the French resistance under Charles de Gaulle. In glamorous parties, the alcohol flowed freely, and so did vital information about harbors, airfields, and the movement of German troops. No one suspected the beautiful performer of quietly soaking up everything she heard. But the trick was how to pass that intelligence to the Allies. If she had been caught, certain death awaited her. But Baker was determined to do what she could. As an entertainer, Baker was able to travel freely without raising any suspicion. She wrote notes on her music sheets in invisible ink. Other times, she hid papers in her undergarments. But one way or another, Baker passed crucial information to the Free French, the British, and the Americans. After the war, President Charles de Gaulle awarded Baker the Croix de Guerre, or Cross of War, the Rosette de la Résistance, and made her a Knight of the Legion of Honor. On June 17, 1943, under cover of darkness, a British plane landed in a field in rural France. After a bumpy landing, a small figure scrambled out. Nor in Nayak Khan was a young Indian princess descended from royalty, and now she was a spy. As Noor gathered her bearings in the darkness, she was already in more danger than she realized. The British agent who organized her landing, Henry Derricourt, was secretly working with the Nazis. Noor had been studying child psychology at the Sorbonne in Paris and had already published a children's book when Hitler invaded France in 1940. Noor's family had escaped in the last boat to sail for Britain from Bordeaux. Despite her pacifist upbringing, Noor was eager to do her part in the war effort, stating her desire to build a bridge between Indians and the British by showing the bravery of her people. She joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force to be trained as a radio operator. Highly skilled at her work, 
nor was soon recruited to use her special abilities undercover in France. Within a week of her landing, Noor was the last radio operator in her spy network, as Derricourt's treachery brought about the arrest and execution of agent after agent. Noor refused an offer to bring her home due to the extreme danger, knowing how much she was needed now that all the others were dead. Constantly on the move, carrying her radio and antenna in a bulky suitcase from location to location, all over Paris, Noor stayed one step ahead of the Gestapo for 12 weeks. As she was the last, they focused all their attention on tracking down her signal, but Noor evaded them time after time, sending and receiving vital messages that kept the resistance alive in her sector. In the end, another traitor brought about her arrest. Renee Gary, sister of one of Noor's fellow operatives, gave the Gestapo her location in exchange for 100,000 francs about $2,000 by today's standards. Some who knew her later testified that the traitor had grown jealous of the beautiful Noor who was receiving the attention of another agent, Franz Antelm. The Gestapo agent in charge of getting information out of Noor, Hans Kiefer, had shown much success winning over male prisoners with feigned friendship. But Kiefer testified about Noor, we got no information whatsoever out of her. Noor was shackled hands and feet for months. Another prisoner stated after the war, I could hear the blows she received. She suffered much. In the end, Kiefer gave up on her and sent her to Germany where she was executed by pistol shot. An eyewitness reported her last word to be liberty. Vera Atkins is rumored to be the inspiration for the unflappable female agent, Moneypenny, in Ian Fleming's James Bond series. In the 1930s, before Hitler had shown his true colors, Vera worked with the handsome Canadian turned British spy, William Stevenson, said to have inspired the character of Bond himself. Together, they hoodwinked information out of Hitler's ambassador to Romania. Atkins and Stevens smuggled the intelligence to Winston Churchill, then in political exile, as he relentlessly warned the British public of the rising danger of Nazi Germany. Vera was born to Jewish parents in Bucharest in 1908. Her family fled Eastern Europe to England in 1937 due to the rising persecution of Jews. But Vera continued to travel and gather intelligence for the British. In 1939, she was part of the team which extracted an Enigma decoder from Poland, which was being used by the Germans to encrypt their secret communications. Capturing the decoder allowed the British to decipher German military messages. When war broke out, Vera was given a high rank in Britain's Special Operations Executive and tasked with organizing the 500 spies Britain sent to Europe to undermine Hitler by setting Europe ablaze. Vera did everything from providing training, cover stories, and fake IDs to sitting up into the early morning hours sending and receiving encrypted messages from agents in occupied France. According to Ian Fleming, in the real world of spies, Vera Adkins was the boss. Apparently, she was not the most likable person in the universe. According to the Times of London, she had a personality like a sledgehammer. But Vera was effective. She was allegedly fond of creative weaponry composed of everyday objects that could be put together in a pinch such as rats stuffed with explosives. She obtained a confession from the notorious commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, which was cited as evidence in the famous Nuremberg trials. She had suggested to him that one and a half million people had been killed at his Auschwitz. He sounded almost affronted at the number, saying, Oh no, it was 2,345,000. After the war, Vera's close relationship with Britain's field agents lit a fire in her heart to find out what had happened to those who never returned. She traveled to Europe and traced down the fates of 117 out of the 118 missing agents, confirming how and where the Nazis had killed them. Vera's investigations were eventually embraced by the British authorities as the public began to grasp the full horror of the Nazi atrocities and the heroism of the Allied spies. The evidence she gathered helped bring many Gestapo agents to justice for war crimes. Her work also uncovered many facts which led to posthumous medals and recognition for British agents such as Noor and Nayak Khan, who history otherwise may have forgotten. Vera said, I could not just abandon their memory. 
Thank you for watching. For another incredible story of an unlikely heroine from World War II, check out this video on Corrie Ten Boom. And let me know in the comments what other brave women from history you'd like us to cover. Be sure to give the video a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an episode. You can do hard things. Be brave, be strong.